I thought I'd wait until we were here until we did a sort of introduction uh, so that people can see the lady that we are talking to whilst I'm describing you. Um, so yes, so for anyone who is watching or watching on catch up, um, this is the first of a new series I thought I was going to be doing uh, called I Want That Job, um, which is talking to you women uh, in sort of more behind the scenes roles in the music industry, asking how they got there getting people like bar to here to give their tips and tricks to any aspiring people trying to work in those industries. Um, my name's Lisa. I'm going to be hosting these uh, every month, once a month is the plan. Um, and then also, if you're watching and you're frantically trying to scribble notes, don't worry, we're going to write everything up. It will be on the 45 site next week um, in a sort of handy YouTube guide form. Um, but yes, so today is the first of a series. Welcome to wonderful Barta Sarandi, uh, who is a producer, mixer, record engineer. Um, she's worked with all sorts of people, uh, Robbie, Dream Wife, Depeche Mound, a little aspiring artist called Bjork, um, she, I feel like you've done so much over your career already, um, and I'm excited to hear all the things that you have to say. Um, so a guest to begin with um what sort of first drew you um to this job like was there something like what kind of was the seeds that got you excited about the learning production and getting into that role yeah. um it started for me when i was uh, 15 uh, i was part of a group of uh students activists um friends back in it and um, we'll be up um in this uh social center um and where there was also at the back to say the um uh the initiatives that they um uh that we were um trying to bring bring forward uh which were a bit uh, well, the venue at the back. Uh, one afternoon, I just took a walk and I saw that there was the box with the mixing desk was open, and so I saw object, massive uh, objects full of faders. I didn't know when they were. Uh, it really um needs, and I want to to understand uh, what what uh, what uh, yeah, no, really. what the, what that was. Um, how did you make those first sort of? Yeah, no, sorry. So someone's saying in the comments that the audio is a bit wonky. It is a little bit for me as well. I don't know whether. Oh, doing that. I know my audio is wonky. Well, that's come on. You're the producer. You should be able to know how to fix this, right? Uh, well, should I wear a hat? Because I'm hearing glitches. Yeah, let's do that. Is that better? Right. Let. Sick. I tell. <laughs> Is this better, everyone? If anyone. Little thing in the comment, I'll keep an eye on it. Um, but ah, oh, made some nice fans make mistakes. Um, yeah, sorry, carry on. So, you were at the and you went to the venue in the back of this bar, you'd seen the desk and was like, Oh, right, what's that? Like, how did you sort of first make the steps in, into learning what that was all about? Well, um, I asked to be introduced to to the sound engineer there, which is which name is Carlo, and then very patiently he started describing to me how the mixing desk there meant that the people on stage would be able to be heard in different in different ways. So, for example, if uh, a singer on stage would have sound very quietly, then on the other side of the stage, uh, a mixing engineer uh, could bring the fader up and then make the uh, performance feel very intimate. 
So ultimately, I started seeing the object as another instrument uh, where you can perform, but you are not sort of like being being seen. You're not on stage, and I thought it was very freeing the the concept that you could alter the listener's experience um, to a, an emotional level and the sound experience on a quality level, and for that to be tied in with you know um, art, but also science and and a world that fe felt to me that in which there would always be scope for uh, experimentation um so all of that i fell in love with sort of first sight um and i started working alongside karma in the venue um to to learn as much as i could but i was still going to school so my time was limited though i was given uh that learning uh, a lot of time uh i then ended up a few years later um doing all of the concerts and theater production and festivals um in in the area where uh where i was born sort of like that uh more italian uh, uh sort of circuit uh, but then there's the big question. I finish high school and you ask yourself, there are really two routes. One is, um, what do you do? Do you go to uni? Do you stay in Italy? Uh, do you continue what you love? Which for me was uh, sound engineering. Or do I go in what the route that I thought I was going to have years before? Um, you know, which for me, he was going into teaching, going into uh, study literature and um, probably philosophy that's what I was going to do. But I chose to move to London because that's where the best opportunities were and because I wanted to move from live uh, sound into studio sound. I wanted to learn uh, the differences and um, wanted to have more time to experiment because live sound is very immediate and it's, it's beautiful for that because there is that... Um, kind of formal performance to it. Um, but yeah, I wanted the time to truly deconstruct uh, sound in a way that I, I couldn't do uh, in live. And there weren't studios or opportunities where I was. Yeah. So that, that's Do you think, um, is it an industry where you sort of have to go and actually formally study somewhere, do you think? Or like how important do you think it is like doing sort of classical training or, you know, going to school or studying a course or something? Well, it depends how uh, how you prefer to learn, really. Uh, I did build both, um, but my learning at school on this subject was very was very short. It was a nine month course. Um, I could not afford any more, so uh, I made the most of it. Um, but I think that you know there is there is part of the job which is good to learn on books, which is which are I will I would say like the more technical side of it, uh, theoretical. And then there is the practical, which obviously you need to, uh, you need to learn on the, on the job and, um, one affect the other. So if it makes people more comfortable to be able to have a, uh, the foundation of, in terms of, um, theory, then there are plenty of good books out on the subjects. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that most of what I learned, I learned it on the job, and I learned it on the uh, on on the situation of being left alone with a with a recording or with a session where I had to really, um, really put myself uh, there and, and and put into practice what. How did you find? Because I think you know, we're talking about like that that going and just you know having to make friends with people and scout out this out. Maybe what are the things that sort of feels quite intimidating about that industry is, you know, you go in and there's these huge mixing desks with like a million buttons and everything looks quite sort of intimidating and scary if you don't know how to use it. Like, how would you say, like, how what, what, how did you get over that? Or did you not really feel that? I understand that. I've been there. But if you look at a really big desk is just one channel multiplied by however many channels so always break it down to one um and learn what one does 
because you know that then everything else does the same when you're, we're talking about, for example, a big mixing desk is, is quite intimidating at times. Um, then a studio, the complexity of a studio is, is, it feels like, you know, I, I feel like when I enter someone else's studio, I'm entering almost like their own brain. The wiring is different. Uh, things are laid differently, but that's the beauty of, um, of studios being unique. Everyone you go to will have, uh, different, uh, qualities. Um, I think it's something that, you know, with, with time and with confidence that you start learning that, um, ultimately is, uh, is a matter of, um, keeping calm and understanding that is the, uh, is all about getting from A to B. So and we have a signal, we want a, a source and we have a destination. And so to think about it in those, uh, simpler terms, then can make it, can make it easier, you know, to break down a massive, uh, kind of sort of intimidating situation into small, um, yeah. and then make it manually quick. Feel that and eventually you'll get there. Um, you're saying that, uh, most things, if you're not able to, because you know, read courses and things are expensive, especially these days, studying is just a wild expense. Um, if people kind of aren't able to, to go and study, and there's certain things that you advise in terms of getting experience in other ways, or like certain books or anything that you found have been really helpful. Um, I would say that um, if you don't have the opportunity to study, um, what I would do is I would um, try and, and befriend people in the same situation and if possible get together and uh, split the cost of maybe buying some gear, buy some equipment, uh, learning it together. Um, if it's possible to create a sort of you know community around you, I found that that always helped and it's also very good to you know to be able to bring each other up uh it is a community after all uh everywhere you know the audio community uh and the music industry i don't like i like to think as a as a community um uh books yes i can i can send you some suggestions because on the top of my head i can't remember the exact title but it was this uh, yamaha sound book that i it was one of my first the first presents that um uh carla the first uh, sort of role model i had gave me and uh it was in english it was hard already to understand sound engineering and then at the time um being 16 my english wasn't very good um so yes i, I remember though uh that after um you know after having learned all the you know a bunch about uh sound engineering going back and reading the theory became easier so sort of like, I think I'm better on learning by doing rather than by reading. So, you know, for me, it was, it was easier to do it and then to go and read why, what I was doing made sense, uh, rather than reading it and doing it because I've read that I should do that. It's sort of like about, you know, kind of hate authority, right? Like that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so for me, like learning by doing is, is probably a bit more exciting for someone approaching the subject because otherwise it can be quite a heavy one uh, in terms of in the physics of sounds etc so it you know it depends whether you want to know what's happening uh in in the speakers in the microphones but if you don't want to know it then you're great okay so if the community aspect is important you move to london like what the sort of first uh, exciting things that you felt really helped bring your career forward till it felt like big milestones for you um well moving to london uh yeah it was a big big change for me and then i sort of had to like rebuild my life in another country and that started with doing the course of nine months i said uh to have something uh very stable in my everyday um Finish that. Uh, really need to find a job because London is expensive. I found this job, which wasn't the the one I truly wanted, but it really helped me um, with that quest. As I said, I wanted to learn everything about sound, breaking it, disintegrating it in my head, and then understanding it. So I, it was in post production. So I worked 
um, really hard for a year employed um, as a runner, as an, as an assistant. So teas and coffees and, and you know, little opportunities to be able to do, um, to uh, edit maybe um, the sound for a film or going to do some location recording for a documentary or do some sound design, which is what I actually really loved. Um, uh, but then I knew that what I really wanted to do and the reason why I moved to London was to find a job in a studio. Um, and that is really hard because, um, you know, most studios um, would not have many openings for uh, for assistance, really. That's the, the way in or running it even. So, um, but I was really determined. And so I started bringing my CVs uh, in person to different studios uh, and calling studios up. And amongst probably, I don't know, 40 that I've called, one said... I'm not going to give you a job, but you can come and we can meet. Uh, for me, it was enough. You see, like, sometimes um, to put a foot in the door, you just need someone to hold it open just lightly for you. Because uh, that's very true. If if someone gives you an opportunity, uh, then you, you then it's up to you to give to make the most of it. Um, and I did that. I showed up and uh, the, the first things that they told me, um, uh, and it was, it was state of the art, uh, and, um, in Richmond. And this was, uh, Dan Britton who said, I don't have a job for you, but I can keep it in mind. And I love that, you know, like he's, he's, uh, so genuinely honest and, um, you know what happened? I said, yes, I don't care. I just want to be here. But a couple of weeks later, he called me up and said, are you free to come and assist on the session? Um, and I said, yes, I'll drop anything. So um, I dropped the other job uh, instantly because I knew that, you know, when, when you're in front of a choice and you know that, yes, you're living, you're living what you have and what you have is kind of stable and you don't know where you're going, but you know that where you're going would be no matter what bought you your dream so you just go for it and so i did you know like i showed up at the session i assisted um made teas made coffees uh didn't touch the console i didn't care i was there i was in the studio and um uh i was called back and then you do a different session another session same studio and then i met uh danton sapple producer who needed an assistant and that was my first um first opportunities after after state of the art that made me able to start working in audio and uh, doing what um uh, doing exactly what i wanted to do um so you see like it's a, it's a series of opportunity uh that you need, really need to 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 pay attention to what's happening in the room and how you can um how you can help and be as helpful as you can and be open and be be receptive uh and really work as hard as as you can um so you need to prove yourself um when you when no one when when you have no credits under your belt that's the hardest thing is is getting some then it's, it's be you know give when someone gives you the, the opportunity and the trust to be able to prove what you can do. Um, and then from there is after that, it was working in different studios and learning and working in um, different studios in London, such as Dean Street, then Strong Room, then Rack. Um, and I, I feel like I've been, you know, I've, I've learned from a lot of people during those years of um, assisting then engineering um and then i was putting into practice what i was learning from different engineers and producers uh whenever the studio was free um i would ask the studio manager if i could use the rooms um in exchange of uh keeping track of any folds on the desk or any gear and uh with the promise of uh making the studio tidier than i found it um so yeah, you know, do, making sure that I kept very good relationship with everyone so that, um, uh, you know, as you, 
as you're trying to to progress um i i feel like it's good to be able to to uh, you know to always give back as soon as you can um and to maintain this sort of like you you know when you are in in the learning process not always it's not about taking and taking and taking i think it's always keeping the the right balance where you are giving a lot and uh as much as you're giving, if you find the right people, the the same people will give to you. Um, so that's how I felt. Like I felt I was, I I became part of a community, and um, uh, at you know at the earliest opportunities, I I was going to watch concerts, and uh, if I liked the concerts and I liked the band, I would ask the band if they wanted uh, to record with me. Uh, and that I didn't have um, much uh, credits to demonstrate to them that I, you know, what my uh, sort of portfolio was, but I was building it at the time. And I, what I could offer where my, where my service is in a studio, uh, thanks to the studio managers that let me have it. Um, and what they were getting was a recording a demo if they wanted or a finished mix if that's what they wanted and that's when as i was saying you know as they throwing yourself into the deep end you're there alone uh with the band or with the artist and you have no assistant because you are the assistant and you are the producer and you are the mixer and you are the engineer um so you do it all and you put into practice what you learned or what you think you knew and you understand whether you truly know it or not, or you're learning it. So that was very, very important because it allowed me to become um, a better assistant than a better engineer and then a better producer and a better mixer uh, by doing it all by myself. Um, and, you know, you work with a band that might be starting out when you're starting out and then that band progresses and then gets signed and then they remember you they tell uh, about you to the record label and then the record label then gets in touch and says hey in 2010 you recorded this band um is now 2013 i don't know um would you like to record them again with a budget you know it's, it's things come back um so you gotta stick with um uh with uh, with what you believe is right and work with people that you believe in and with music that you like because that if you do a good job and you're more, more likely to do a good job if, if you love what you're doing then um, high the, the chances are high that you you get called back and uh, so you know it's a, it's a small industry after all is a uh, word of mouth is important um and I started getting like that, uh, my first project, uh, to, you know, my first productions to do on my own. Um, uh, it's sort of, it's a progressive, uh, uh progressive evolution. The saying was that everyone, uh, worked in those very early things that you've kind of carried on working with and then got called back to do in the way that you were just saying. Is there anyone that you sort of worked with like really early on like that, that then you did get and that you did end up kind of getting called back? Yeah, there is uh, like uh, Philip Selway, for example. Um, he's a um, uh, radio drummer and artist uh, who just released an album and I produced that and I recorded vocals uh and did some engineering for his album prior to this one in gosh a long time ago maybe more than 10 years ago and i think that session more than 10 years ago was one of the first session i was engineering in london so you know fast forward 10 years 12 years or so and you're producing a record uh that you were recording like 10 years before um that for example um uh or uh the depeche record uh james ford i i i worked with him on on different projects as a mixer um and then he 
called me like uh, last spring uh, asking me whether I uh, wanted to to record a new Depeche record with him. Uh, obviously, I said, yes, I love Depeche and I love working with James. Um, I was an assistant on an album um, uh, by Dave Gunn and Soul Savers probably 12 years ago. So I was an assistant back then uh, to Soul Savers. And you see, like 10 years after, I'm recording with James, uh, Martin, and Dave. Say, why? Too many things that you said in that last um, answer that are just so important, like being brave, sort of learning as you go, and putting yourself in situations that be perfect, but you sort of learn on the job. Um, and just be nice to be. You know, I think the fun is like cool thing from everything is if you're a nice person to be around and you don't, you know, you come in and you're great for the opportunity and like you know, actually you give stuff back as well. I think that, that is so integral to, <laughs> to succeed because, you know, no one wants to be stuck in a tiny studio with someone that's a dickhead. So, <laughs> I know, yeah. Uh, you know, there is enough dickheads out there. I don't need one in the studio. Um, there was someone in the comments that asked a while back, um, how do you write a CV as an assistant? Which I think is actually a good question. Like, if you don't have that much experience under your belt, um, like, how how would you sort of sell yourself in other ways or what are the things that you think are still valuable to people um, that might not be just experience, but, like, you know, if some, I don't know, if you if you wanted to get CVs for someone to come into you, what what would you want to see on one? I I would say that what I like to see is sometimes it's not about at all having like a thousand credits at all. Like actually the opposite. Um, because sometimes I get I get CVs of of people who are overqualified to be an assistant. Um. And I think I would be better suited in, you know, uh, building their own studio and doing production or mixing. Um, I think, uh, you know, to be an assistant, um, first thing, first thing that, that I would look for would be someone who can be very met quite methodical and tidy and um, with attention to detail. And I mean, like very deep attention to detail so someone who can um really understand that um the hours yeah the hours are long but the hours don't don't need to be long if you really do your job properly and um that job consists mostly for an assistant um uh well it depends like for me it would be like um someone who is uh proficient with uh pro tools which is the DAW I use but if they're not who someone who is willing to learn so I think what I look for in someone is um the hunger for learning and uh, the sort of that spark that makes you believe that they they want to be there that means it's something for them um like it did for me, sort of, I want to see the same attitude and um, I like to see, um, as we said, kindness, um, just, you know, simple traits, as we said, but, uh, you know, sometimes simple traits are quite complex and they're hard to find. Um, someone who can be uh, open and excited about projects, because that is that that's what you like to see. You see, like to feed off someone else's excitement about something. Um, someone who can make your your life, my life, easier rather than help other. You know, uh, someone who can be proactive. Um, a saying, yeah, you asked me to do this, but I also done this. Um, do you like it? Yes. No. no, no. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll I'll change it like this. And you know, someone who can be proactive and not just do the job, but do something more. That's how I felt when I was um, when I was learning or uh, when I was engineering, uh, where I was assisting. I would al always try and anticipate what I was about to be asked. But that's a very uh, very important uh, quality because if so, if you are an assistant and you're in the room, you hear the 
the producer is talking about recording vocals, then don't wait until you get asked to set up a vocal mic. Just go and start setting up a vocal mic. Um, you know, be proactive and be bold. Um, but then also know when it's time to 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 sit and 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 wait. Um, because there's a lot of that. I mean, a session is is um, sort of um, is a mixture of everyone's feeling and. Um, uh, artists can be different, artists can be comfortable with people around or can be more comfortable not having someone extra in the room. So as an assistant, also know when to step out, try and read the room, which again, like, you know, a lot of this job, it consists in technical knowledge uh, and a lot of this job consists in reading the room and understanding sort of the, yeah, the mood and what people um, kind of what people ex not expect, but what they don't even expect, but what you feel like the right thing to do. Um, so yeah, all of these I would uh, I would look for in uh, in an assistant as much as um, I was looking. Um, I was trying to achieve it myself. Um, I feel as well. Uh, people are wanting more name. Maybe I wanted to name drop a little bit more. So I like, kept to give examples of that stuff on like projects that you've worked with. Are there certain artists that you think work in like particularly different ways that show that? Is there an album that you've worked on where you really had to sort of like adapt to someone who's working with it and it's kind of pushed you out of your comfort zone or anything like that? I don't know about name dropping, but like every every album is different. Yes, every I sometimes uh, be pushed out of my comfort zone, which is good. Um, I don't want to be in my comfort zone. <laughs> I know what it looks like. I might as well be pushed out of it because then I learn something different. Um, every artist is uh, have their own uh, way of working, and it depends from where they come from in terms of like um what their method is like some artists prefer to not be part for for example of like the mixing process and some of them need to see 10 every day and that doesn't mean that they've been backseat drivers so it just means that for them it makes more sense for their process to be there present and that makes it easier for me because it's i understand better what they want uh, rather than having endless email chains uh, or calls. Um, uh, um, Production-wise, some artists leave a lot of freedom and really do want uh, to, you know, me to bring my own um, uh, my own set of um, I don't know experiments or like ideas and everything. So. I, I am lucky and I feel that people come to me because of that because they they want uh they want my input uh uh like a hundred percent. But then other artists in fact, instead will be more set in sort of like they, they want someone who can elevate what they have already, uh but not um uh not completely change it so like there'll be like different sets of sort of uh, rules you should be within and that's good as well because it means that you learn how to work within someone else's uh, mindset um, and I think a good producer a good mixer is able to do to the both to be able to sit within uh, the boundaries that um, uh, that the artists uh, feel they're important to have and then to be focused on one um, on on the album on the record as it is, uh, and then other artists inside want want to explore and want want you to be to join them in that sort of journey. But like I couldn't really make specific examples because it's not as black and white as that. That like um, in what I worked in, there has been like maybe tracks that are more one way or another. But um, um, it depends. So I feel like um, like the forty five. As a publication, it's very uh, it's focused on women and non-binary people, and like really kind of like putting those voices out there. So I feel like it's kind of 
unavoidable to mention, you know, I was reading the stat that it's still, I think it's 2.8% of producers. There was the latest statistic are uh, female identifying, which is still just mad. Um, like, how, do you, like, have you felt within your time working with producers that that's starting to get better? Or do you, do you kind of feel like, um, are there ways to really encourage sort of female identifying? people beginning to kind of you know not not that as like a hard job so um yeah i'm very disappointed by the statistics and they've been like um um uh the statistics i know have been five percent of music producers uh worldwide uh very sad uh uh female so even less of that 5%, um, uh, if we consider non-binary and other minorities, which is even more sad because it means that the landscape of music gets created by a very small percentage of um, diversity and just a big homogeneous uh, white male dominated um, landscape. So that's not representative of what the music uh, should be because I believe music should represent society and uh, to be able to truly represent what society looks like should be as diverse as society. Um, so I did feel very, um, you know, uh, uh, responsible to try and push the uh, the balance as much as I can. Uh, so my act of um, being here um, and being a woman in the industry, I try and bring up other people like me so that they balance gets um, a little bit uh, more towards the, the fair uh, side. Um, and I believe that will, because I believe that will enrich the music in the, in the landscape. And I think it's about time, to be honest. Um, what, um, what there needs to be are opportunities and equal opportunities. And I think that um, that is what we are going towards now is to uh, put more pressure on gatekeepers or uh, let's say the people at the, at the top of different pyramids and triangles, uh, people who are in power and have been in power for long enough to be able to di dictate the rules and smash the glass ceilings for um, others. As I said, it takes someone to prop the door open, but that someone needs to hold that door for you. Um, and then you can smash it open, hopefully. Uh, but there needs to be, you know, people need to bring each other up and uh, people need to be, um, people need to be aware of the problem. And, and it's good that we're talking about it. Um, and I always dream of one day where we're not going to be talking about it because finally we'll, we'll have achieved that. Um, something which, you know, it should, should be should be achievable i think um i've seen i've seen in my sort of 13 years now i am here in london uh doing what i do and i've seen a change i come from a place where i was the only female uh engineer and so much so that people would not even say my surname they would say marta yeah the engineer um and uh, I didn't meet many people um, who, uh, you know, would be non-male um, and doing the job that I was doing until I came to London and I was uh, lucky to have one of my first sessions with Manuel, who is an amazing engineer and producer. Um, and for me, it was really special. It was really important. Uh, it allowed me to see myself uh, in someone else. And I think representation is very important. Uh, it shouldn't end uh, with, um, you know, with uh, with female representation. It should go way beyond it. I I hope. Um, and I uh, I think it's important to give to give space to uh, to different people to come up. And I've seen uh, lately in recent years that uh different uh uh different like uh, the weird word to say gatekeepers but different uh people who've been in their position for quite a long time to shift and i've shift uh consciously and say i now need to make space for someone else 
that can lead uh, these company, these uh, record label. And I think that's that's really good. That's what I would do if I was head of a uh, big record label or if I was in my total 60s uh, and if I was a man, I would say now is my time to give space and uh, be part of the change. Because um, I think like that, then, you know, it, it, it gives a strong message um, and uh, it's, it's hard to get... Um, it's hard to get credits when you're starting out. And if um, if people keep employing the same people out of uh, laziness, uh, then there isn't space for a new generation to come through. But I do have a huge um, positivity, kind of feel very positive about newer generations coming through. And then at some point, you know, I'll be old and I hope that... Uh, uh, I will look around and I will feel like, wow, all these all these um, kids uh, are now the CEO of major record labels, and they are doing what we were trying to do before. And I hope this is not just a dream. Um, I think it's going to happen soon. Uh, uh, we're doing we're doing everything we can, aren't we? I feel good, and also you know, absolute credit to you for just being so I don't know. Like you're, uh, you've done so much amazing work, and I feel like that system. But you know, like you say, you need people that are doing it that you can look to and see, and see someone that is sort of moving or see path where you feel like that looks plausible or like you can do it. And I think you've done so much, like you know, bringing rare awards, winning awards, or. Here's the dream, and um, I'm sure that there's so many people that see your career and, and feel like that is a really is thing. So, Thank you. right, well, I feel like I've picked on here for a while, so maybe before I let you go, as a nice little kind of line to end to this chat, um, is that when you look back at everything that you've done so far, is there one album that you've worked on that you feel like? It's kind of uh enjoyable experience or the one that, you know, when you're telling the grandkids about these different I mean, uh it's hard to pick. Um uh, the Bjork record that it makes well is always gonna have a special place in my heart. Um and that's because um, I got to experience it in 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 Iceland with her, and for me that was very special because it really allowed me to dive deep into um, into the album um, and to be able to look out of the studio window and see the mountains of Iceland that have no trees, and you can see the shape of um, exactly the curve of um, of of the earth on the mountains and to see the blue and and the colors on on the sunset uh, it was just something else it was just very 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 powerful to be there with her and to feel her trust in me um, was very empowering and I love how she makes you feel empowered by um, by believing in you and uh, giving you the space to express yourself. And uh, she's such a respectful person and so generous. Um, I sort of, um, that's how I want to be. That's how I want to be with um, with people. And uh, I saw it. Um, I saw it in her and it, it it shows in the mixes that I did, I think. Uh, those emotions were there, where I, like, sort of, I tried to infuse the mixes with as much as what I was feeling uh, as also what, you know, what, what the mixes needed to be technically too. Uh, but my enthusiasm, I, when I listen to that album, I feel it. Um, and so it's something you know, that is a diary would always be there, and it means something for me, means something for for other people. So it's it's you know it's a personal experience, but 
I guess that's uh, that would be one. But I kind of going back to what you were saying right at the start about you know being able to have an impact on the music and how everything goes. You know, that you're even though you're not the one on the stage, that you're still sort of altering these things and being part of the process. So that feels like a perfect way to. Um, about sending ECBs, which I won't make you obviously do here, but maybe afterwards, um, people tell you or get in touch or like I don't know, DM you or something like that if they're interested. Um, um, yes, but yes, thank you so much. That was honest. Thank you, really and inspiring. And like genuinely, I mean, like I have absolutely no production um, skills whatsoever, but I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, and I hope that anyone that is watching this that has trust pursued it and take these things on board and feels inspired that it's not um, not an impenetrable thing to get into that you've just sort of got to give it give it a go and be brave and talk to people and be nice. Um, yes. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, excited for or have you got any like can you tell us anything that you're working on at the moment or is it all hush hush uh there is a record that i'm very proud of his uh just come out is desire maria um they are on mute um and it's an amazing record um i had the pleasure of mixing and i would say check it out and See how you feel. I think it's right. Uh, Rob, go do that and go and bring my bus skipping you. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. It's lovely to chat to you. Um, and anyone watching this, um, if you uh, have an interest in other areas of the industry, we're going to be doing these as a series once a month with different people. There's going to be people from like sort of label PR and techie stuff and all different sides of the industry. So hopefully there'll be something for everyone. Bye. 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 I don't really like. Oh, God.